Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Chalenza. I'm the James B. Knapp Dean of the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences here at Johns Hopkins University. I'm also a professor of history and classics. I'm just so very thankful that you're, you're joining us today um, uh, for this conversation. And I'm especially, especially thankful that we have with us um, Dr. Karen Wolf, whom I should say for, about whom I can say, first of all, um, Karen, you have your PhD from Johns Hopkins University in history. Um, so, so I think that's just wonderful um, uh, for us to talk about. And I guess we wanted to talk a little bit today about, um, you know, how, how, how the history PhD has worked in your life and career. And I think it's important just to introduce you a little bit. Um, um, you've done a number of different things in your career, but you, you spent a long stint at William and Mary, um, where you were professor of history and also the executive director of the Omohundra Institute of Early American History. I, I believe that was from 2013 on, right? That's just an incredible place um, and a very vibrant um, you know, place for the historiography and history of the early, er, early um, of the early Americas, and we can talk a little bit more about that. But you're now, um, as of October, at Brown University as the Beatrice and uh, Julio Ma Mario Santo Domingo Director and Librarian of the John Carter Brown Library. Um, and so congratulations on that tremendous appointment. Thank you, thank you. And, and I should say that there's been a number of other things, very interesting things among many, we could talk about your CV all day, but just to highlight a couple of things, you know, a, a number of books among them, um, the Diary of Hannah Callender Sansom, Sense and Sensibility in the Age of the American Revolution, which you edited along with Susan Klepp, um, your book, Not All Wives, Women of Colonial Philadelphia, which came out in 2000, your, your book, Milka Martha Moore's book, a commonplace book from revolutionary America, um, and you're currently at work, if I'm not mistaken, on, on ideas about family and genealogy and the politics of connection. Um, and, and I just think that it's also worth mentioning, and we can talk a little bit about this as well. You're one of the founders of, of Women Also Know History, which I think is a, is a fantastic resource. You know, you'll often hear people say, well, we just can't find um, this or that type of person, maybe a woman or something like that for scholarly panels. Women who also know history is a way of doing that. Um, and I think a very welcome way um, to make sure that people's own networks don't blind them to being much more inclusive when it comes to, to scholarship and, and scholarly participation. Um, but, but I wonder if we could talk a little bit then, Karen, just maybe we could start off about, let's just talk a little bit about the John Carter Brown Library. I mean, could you tell this group a little bit of, about it and, and you know, how your journey has taken you there and what kinds of things that you see um, as being most appealing there? Well, thank you, Chris. It's a great honor um, to be in this conversation with you. I appreciate it enormously. And um, thanks to all of you for joining this conversation. It's really wonderful to see all of you here. I actually see some, um, some names I know, some folks I, I know already. Um, so the John Carter Brown Library, of which I am firmly, as of October 15th, the world's biggest fan, um, <laughs> is a fantastic, um, fantastic library. It's a special collections library, one of the independent research libraries of America, although located here at Brown University and an integral part of the university. It is, um, I'm not sure everyone would call it the library of the early Americas, but I'm going to go ahead and say that. Um, it's an extraordinary collection that began in the 19th century as so much collecting did um, as a kind of collecting enterprise, we could talk about this as well, of um, a wealthy and privileged family from Providence, the Brown family. Um, and the building actually was built in 1904. And since 1904, the JCB has been open to researchers who are interested in hemispheric history before 1800. So the library has a very focused collection in the early Americas, about 60,000 volumes and an untold number of maps and special, specialized manuscripts. Um, and it is uh, one of the world's treasures, I think, um, having collected this kind of concentrated, focused um, set of materials which have enlivened and informed scholarship um, for 12 decades now. It's exciting to me in two dimensions. First of all, because I think the early Americas are um, a kind of foundational history um, for those of us who live in the United States and for people around the world who are affected by 
the decisions and choices of uh, people in the United States. The early Americas is foundational history. It is critical that we understand it in its greatest fullness, depth and complexity. So there is the subject matter itself, which is compelling to me and which is exciting um, as I take up the leadership of this, um, this institution. And the second thing I wanna say is that it's exciting to me because I think reflecting on how the institutions that have shaped knowledge um, have their own histories is really compelling. I did some of this work at the Omohundro Institute too, but just thinking about, look, these are institutions which are formed in a very different moment, um, which uh, in the case of a library, aggregate certain kinds of materials, describe those materials, catalog them and make them accessible in certain ways that have informed what we know. So the history of how we know what we know is as compelling, I think, to me as the history itself and is equally deserving of our energy in creating kind of inclusivity and access. That is, if I want us all to understand the histories of the early Americas, I also want us to understand how we understand what we do at this point about them. Um, and that uh, institutional history is, is compelling work to me. So I'm excited to be here and thanks for asking about it. No, it's great. And I, I, I think that, uh, thank you for that. And I think a, a couple of things occur. The first is, it seems to me that you found a way to have connections in the ways that you view, broadly speaking, you know, the, the, the parts of the historical discipline that you've, that you've taken part of and the different roles you've had. And I guess, I, I know that there is this almost like a hashtag, a phrase, vast early America. <laughs> Right. And, and it seems to me that what's signaled by that as a historian who's worked on very, very different things is just that, you know, there's there's so much to um, our early history and it spans everything from, you know, uh, different geographies that might have been part of standard accounts to certainly um, broader realms of people to take into account. Um, and, and I wonder how that sense of, you know, let's say epistemological inclusivity has, you know, how do we know this history? How, has that affected your view of when you've done administrative leadership? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I can't tell you how often I wish people would ask me about the hashtag Vast Early America and they don't always, <laughs> um, but actually Vast Early America uh, came out of precisely that kind of commitment to thinking holistically and inclusively about um, historical practice as well as historical subjects. That is that when we think about vast early America, we think about um, not only a traditional early American past, which has been focused on British colonies and on political processes and economic processes and a kind of hyper-focus on the American revolution actually, um, but rather a much more expansive geographical frame, but also a much more e expansive um, topical frame where we understand settler colonialism and we understand the Atlantic slave trade as mutually constitutive processes as profound and as shaping, if not more so than ultimately kind of Anglo-American styles of governance. So that kind of topical inclusivity comes with an imperative to understand how it is that we ever came to see that British American and kind of political focus as the early America. And we did that in part because of institutions that shaped what we thought we should know. Um, and you see this in public discourse yeah. now all the time about what early America should look like. So yes, absolutely. And for me, um, when I was at the Omohundro Institute, furthering this perspective on vast early America, both as a kind of commitment to subject and methodology, and also to who is practicing history, but also understanding the shape of these institutions was um, both um, an imperative, but also an incredibly exciting opportunity. Um, that's the kind of work I think you can do in administration actually, is you can actually build things and you can actually make a difference, um, yeah, which is know, why of course I'm drawn to this work. It's funny, I've, I've felt some similar things for me in my own work. I had done some work early on, um, you know, uh, scholarly work editing Latin texts from the 15th century. And I gradually came to think, well, how did this, why did this period, why was this period received the way it was? How did it get constructed? And then ultimately, what was the institutional history behind it? And then I actually wrote a little bit about the 19th century and how 19th century universities were shaping factors. 
And it was soon after that that I too started getting interested in doing other things as well, like administrative sorts of things, because you realize that the, the institutions on the one hand and the knowledge enterprises that they foster and nourish, mm -hmm. and sometimes often, you know, with unconscious assumptions shape, they're really mm -hmm. connected, right? And, and, yes. and to me, it was important to have a role and to have a little bit of a foot in both realms. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I think we, ha we have traveled a very similar kind of intellectual and kind of professional process in that in that way. Um, I think those things are absolutely related. And once you begin to think about how the 19th century has shaped things, and of course, coming out of Hopkins and coming out of the kind of Hopkins, you know, uh, progenitor of the discipline in some critical ways, you can't help but reflect on the shape of these institutional structures. I used to tell my um, graduate students all of early America all the time, like it'll be a long time before we get over the 19th century. Um, and that's, you know, <laughs> the things that were put in place, the things that were prioritized in the 19th century and then passed on forward. Um, wow, it, it, it's hard to, hard to yes. shake. Yes, I think there was a, a kind of interesting set of collisions then, right? Everything from, you know, the sort of at the early part, the apogee of kind of romantic individualism. And so you had this very strong idea of one author and one text rather than mm -hmm. the kind of much more collaborative world that yes. you sometimes see in the pre-modern world. You have, mm -hmm. you know, no, no, there's the technology, right? The rise of steam press powered printing with movable type, you know, yes. printing in the early 19th century. So it all of a sudden it gives you the chance to sort of spread things much more broadly. And, and then all of that becomes embedded in really the foundations of the modern university as we know it now, right? With the 1810 Humboldt reform that then gradually, you know, sweeps uh, Europe and then eventually leads to the, literally the foundation of Johns Hopkins University and the University of Chicago. And then other universities in the US kind of adopted some of that framework, right? So a lot of that stuff was there where in some ways generationally, even though it seems like a long time ago, you know, we're maybe one or two handshakes away from disciplinary founders who were deeply embedded in those 19th century traditions. Yes, let me pick up on one of the things that you mentioned there and just to extend the metaphor of the handshake, I think the handshake and the notion of a kind of closed circle yes. of people who were able to do that work is really significant here. And the other thing I, I just want to note is, you know, when you talked about kind of uh, romantic individualism, I think the notion of the author pulling away from an understanding of the full ecosystem, which produces knowledge and scholarship has been so devastating. And it's so important for us to understand that obviously as individual people, we have thoughts and ideas and we express them, but we do that in community and we do that in communities of production. Yes. Um, so, you know, we do that in, in exchange with our colleagues as we share in the famous Hopkins seminar, you know, what would work be without that kind of collective exchange and input? We do that with editors, we do that with the folks who are creating metadata around our scholarship. We do that with the platform. There are so many ways in which we are embedded in collaborative process. And I guess, you know, one thing that has really marked my professional experience is intensive collaboration, just collaboration of, of all kinds. Women Also Know History continues to be one of the best collaborative experiences of my life with Keisha Blaine and Emily Prefogel, the three of us, mm -hmm. and also um, a group of um, a group of uh, uh, advisory board members. But you know, everything good that I've done has been in collaboration um, and has been you know in appreciation for how we live in a kind of ecosystem of knowledge production. That's part of what makes library work cool. You know, yeah, too. yeah. Can you, I mean, can you reflect a little bit on the evolution of your thinking on that front, the collaboration front? Because I guess I ask because, you know, we have people on, on this Zoom who are coming from different disciplines. Yeah. Um, a number will probably be from humanities disciplines. And, and there's a kind of overlay in the humanities where it's, it's often about one person and one work. And I wonder how your own evolution took place, because I do think what I found, you know, because we have people on this on this Zoom who are going to be interested in, you know, doing other things, per perhaps, than, than just one, you know, the pro entering the professoriate. And in most other things, you must work in teams, right? Like, it's right. just an imperative. It's a necessity. Right. It's never going to be just you. It's always going to be that you're relying on people, you're trusting people, they're trusting you. So how did your evolution take place on that front? Because obviously you came out of this in a disciplinary way as a historian, right? You know, as a, with a PhD. So how, how did it work for yep. you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a lot in that. There's a lot in that question. Uh, so one thing I guess is that you know I was a humanities kid uh, growing up in a STEM household. Um, so my parents were working in um, in collaborative teams all the time. 
and we're always talking about project teams. So the idea of a single author always seemed a little, um, a little yeah. peculiar to me. At the same time, let me just talk about it from a slightly different vantage, which is also, I think sometimes there is um, not enough recognition of how even folks who are working in big collaborative teams need time to themselves, you know? So I think about the evolution of the open office plan, which I think we can all now roundly condemn as a complete disaster. People need private and quiet time to process, but they also need space and encouragement to collaborate. So for me, um, how this worked for me, um, you know, in, in particular in my, in my professional life is that I simply had the opportunity to interact with folks who encouraged collaboration. Um, and that sounds really facile. Um, and it also sounds like, well, that was just this thing that happened to me. But I really think that if one is open to collaboration, collaboration comes to you. Um, there are so many um, networks of folks who want to work collaboratively out there in the world, whether it's on um, digital projects right now. I look at, so I think about in my own field, I think about digital projects um, of uh, early career folks, whether it is the Junto blog, which is now, you know, that's now a middle-aged sort of project or Insurrect, which is a wonderful new resource, which, um, you know, developed a couple of years ago, which is all early career, early Americanists, um, but collaborative digital projects, people coming together to make something new together. I think it's, um, you know, I also found that it was more exciting for me to see things happen and that I could see things happen um, in my own scholarship, you know, inside my head, I was coming up with ideas that was cool. But I also wanted to see things happen organizationally and to see change happen organizationally. And to do that, you have to work collaboratively. So whether it was Women Also Know History or a project that I was deeply involved with at William & Mary and co-founding a neurodiversity project on raising awareness and um, acknowledgement of uh, neurodiversity across campus and worked with big interdisciplinary teams um, and inter-office teams. Collaboration is the way to make things happen. It's incredibly enriching work. Yeah, I, I, I really, I've agreed with, with that too. It's, it's, it can be very fulfilling when you, you let go a little bit of the idea that <laughs> You know, you're the one individual that has to control the whole thing, and realize that you know it's never going to work anyway. But you might as well right. let go of that implicit idea and realize you, you know you're embedded in teams. And I guess, I mean, there's a lot we can talk about just for housekeeping reasons too. I just want to let the folks on the call know that please feel free to put questions in the chat, and we'll also reserve some time at the end uh, today for you know some open conversation, open questions. I just realized I'd forgotten to say that. But I wonder if we could talk about a couple of things that have come up already. So the first would be, can you talk from your viewpoint about women also know history? How, how did that come up? You know, where, where were you at that point in your career? What were you looking out at at the field of history? How, how did that all work? Well, there were a couple of different things that were happening. This was in 20, um, 2015, 16. A couple yeah. of different things were happening at the same time. I, I am not, this is not speaking out of school because this is on the public record, but um, but I was starting to deal with what would become public in a couple of years down the road, um, a historical case of sexual harassment at the Omohundro Institute. Okay. And thinking about how deeply these institutions, um, do you know the hashtag, by the way, thanks for typing? No, it's, no, no. It's a, it's a hashtag um, that reflects how even among um, kind of privileged white um, academic families, um, women who were doing serious academic research were relegated to acknowledgements as yes. thanks for yeah, typing. Sure. So yeah. hashtag okay. thanks for yeah. typing. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so with Omohundro Institute, which had a long history of being a fairly exclusive, but not entirely, not entirely, but, but fairly, you know, a predominantly white institution also had a deep history of this, this historical sexual harassment case that I was dealing with. And I was thinking about the shape of the institution and already working with colleagues on ways to just make the institution um, more inclusive, uh, both because it's the right thing to do and also because it was the smart thing to do. Because let's face it, you know, you, the incredible um, uh, scholarship that was being produced by people who would have been excluded from this place um, was all to the good of the field and, you know, needed, um, anyway, wanted to be engaged with. Um, so I was thinking about that and there were some discussions about some specific things that happened with historical conferences that entirely um, were devoted, uh, that entirely profiled white guys. 
Um, and so some colleagues and I started just looking at Google searches. And if you, go you did a Google search for historian, you would come up with a bunch of white guys wearing you know, tweed and elbow patches. Um, so I started uh, talking with a colleague who had founded a similar project, or this was really the progenitor project in political science called Women Also Know Stuff, mm. um, uh, Christina Walbrecht at Notre Dame, and said, you know, we'd like to do one for history. Can we rip off your idea, basically? And she said, yes, let's collaborate on that and let us help you. And uh, they had designed uh, this, uh, this database that was the back end for the website, which is a kind of profile site where people could build profiles. And then I reached out to some other colleagues and ultimately Keisha and Emily and I um, uh, did a session at, a, at the Berkshire Conference for Women Historians. And then we launched the social media. And then a year later, we saw, launched the, the website. And the basic premise was, look, historians look lots of different ways. Historians are lots of different ways. Historians are lots of different people. And we wanted to make this particular point um, that women also know history. Women are also historians. And uh, by that, that language of women, we have also on the website recognized um, how important it is not to be so binary about, about women. Um, and we have some inclusive language there around gender identity, um, which I think is incredibly important. But the, the principal motivation was to simply make the point that historians are not just white guys and that historical authority and historical expertise comes in many different forms from many, many different people, so. Yeah, that's interesting. So in some ways it's about just, you know, making an effort, right, as a community to, um, first, try to excavate what normative images of certain professions or fields or identities might be, and then just yep. be able to step out of that notionally normative model, which it turns out isn't normative at all, right? I mean, yes. it's, it's actually we're startlingly diverse in so many ways. And, yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, all of us got tired of, you know, and I, I mean, I know we still do get tired of seeing people on, you know, on national news and, you know, it's the same kind of three people who are quoted as historians and Anyway, it gets tedious. It's getting better, but not, you know, not, not as, not as good as we would like. But I mean, it's interesting too, in that even in that sense, right? The idea that women also know history now gives, you know, it, it enables a chance to speak for oneself versus, you know, when you would have media, let's say, going to experts, a lot of that will just have been because of habit, and, and mm -hmm. I think it does with the with the digital the sort of revolution we're living with the media revolution we're living through. It does strike me that if one doesn't take kind of possession and ownership of one's own online, you know, identity, right? Yes. Um, either other people are going to do it for you, or you won't really be part of the picture, right? I mean, it does yeah. mean that, that publishing means something fundamentally different, maybe, from what it used to be. Mm -hmm. I wonder yeah, no, we... absolutely. There's, a, I mean, there's just one more thing I would mention, yeah, which sure, is yeah. that um, there's a piece of this that involves systems thinking too, which is how do you get into the workflow of journalists? Journalists have sources yes. and they have people that they always yeah. reach out to. So how do you get into that workflow so that they think about um, consulting women also know history? And I think we have made a difference there. Yeah. It's not absolute, but um, you know, it's not nearly as successful as you know. I mean, of course, we want to um, run the world there, but. Um, but I do think we've made a difference and we've also, uh, we've, the website has become an incredible resource for people putting together um, panels at, at conferences too. Yes. We hear that all the time, that people use it all the time for speakers and for, for conference sessions. So. Yeah, it's a real achievement and I just mm. congratulate you on it. And of course, you're oh, well, it's, it's um, a, yeah, yeah, no, it's a community project. It is definitely a community and all of those, you know, over 5,000 um, historians who have, um, who have produced profiles on the site. And um, yeah, it's a community project. Indeed. I wonder, so so talking about, so if we return to, you know, this idea of, you know, you have a PhD in history and a humanities discipline and, and it served you well in a lot of different environments, some, you know, traditionally connected to the work, right? Publishing books, you know, editing and so on. Others maybe not so traditional. I wonder if we could just talk in practical terms a little bit about what sorts of things you faced, what sorts of possible transformations in your own thinking and identity you had to go through. I mean, I guess we could say, ask the question, when you were heading up um, the Omaha Institute, when you were executive director, just what kinds of responsibilities did you have there? And then mm -hmm. we can transition to the, the John Carter Brown Library, what kinds of responsibilities mm -hmm. you know, they had? And, and where, where did you feel like your, 
you know, some of that PhD education stuck with you and maybe served as a basis for some of it? And where did you have to add competencies, credentials, et cetera, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Well, let me start with the last one, which is, um, you know, sort of where does my where does my training as a historian help me? And I, I've heard this from other folks um, rooted in other disciplines too, but that being a historian is so fundamental to my leadership. That is, I always want to know more about the historical context for the institution that I'm working for, for how it has functioned in the world. Um, and I, I hear that from others too. So um, early on, a friend who is an engineer at Google um, referred me to a particular practice at Google, a, a particular kind of style of project management. Um, and it is such a kind of software systems thinking. And I was like, this is fascinating. And it actually was enormously helpful to me, but it just reminded me that you can, whatever your disciplinary background, it's likely to be of enormous help to your leadership style. That is, I don't think that there is a generic you know, leadership, you know, leadership. And I don't think there is a generic practice. There are some best practices for sure. We'll talk about that. Um, but your own disciplinary commitments and training can be enormously helpful to you, whatever your, your background is. Um, and I know that, um, you know, as a, a, at the Omohundro Institute and now at the John Carter Brown Library, I report to a, to a board and I've been on boards. And when you deal with boards, um, you know, they're interested in and they deal with different kinds of leadership styles, but I hear from them all the time. You're such a historian. Um, and it is true. Um, my training as a historian is just inimical to my, um, to my professional practice. Um, and, and also to the way I, I understand my, uh, my priorities, I guess, but the kinds of things that, um, that kind of surprised me and that also surprised me because I was excited about um, included just basic financial competence and budgeting, um, which are, these are things that as a, as a faculty member or even as a, a participant in other kinds of project work, I didn't have an opportunity to learn a lot about before I started diving in. Um, so, you know, budget competence, you know, when you understand a budget, then you really know what you can do. Um, you really understand the, you know, where are the levers. Um, and I would say the most important thing actually is staff management, um, which is to all, I think externally um, that that's a little bit invisible, but it has always, it's, you know, at the Omohundro in here, it's easily 60% of my job um, is supporting the experts that work in the organization and figuring out what you can best do to help support them to do the work that they're so terrific at. Mm -hmm. um, and then managing, um, you know, uh, hiring and retaining and developing staff, just fantastically important work. It's, it's, I can't say how important that is. And some of that involved things like, wait, I really need to talk to those people in HR. And I really need to understand how much expertise they have in HR, which is, it turns out, not just a group of people who are going to make me check boxes, but people who have an insight on particular practices that I need to understand and not just people who are going to help me, you know, structure a hire or a search or whatever. Um, so I would say budget and, and, um, and staff management are the two things that have been most important um, that didn't come directly from my training um, as, a, as a historian. I mean, it's very interesting. So, so for the folks on, who are on this Zoom call with us who are from the Johns Hopkins community, and I know we have folks from outside the community too, but we do have this um, wonderful program that's now being run out of the provost office. It's headed up by Dr. Roshni Rao um, and Christine Kelly, who introduced us, um, is a crucial part of the leadership of this program too. Um, it's called Futures with a PH, and it's about thinking about how you know, people who are doing PhD work in academia can prepare themselves for a mul multiple career eventualities, all of which can be very meaningful and satisfying. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important. And so I think that one of the things that, that has struck me is that I am wondering if we need to think earlier in a typical process, especially in the humanities PhD, not so much in departments, obviously, of offering those kinds of trainings in things precisely as you say, like budgeting or like HR slash management, but making it open at an earlier career phase to people, meaning, meaning, you know, here anyway, Johns Hopkins, it's going to be about being much more activist about pointing people toward futures, right? You know, even if you're a first or second year PhD student, for all of us who are in the professoriate, you know, realizing we've got to be open to this and encouraging about this and have those conversations be open conversations. Um, 
And I wonder what you think about that. I wonder what you've mm. heard. Um, you know, I know you have many contacts nationwide and you're going to have tons more, you know, now that you're at the John Carter Brown Library where so many people are going to be coming in and out and visiting and so on. But what do you think about that, about kind of the curricula for graduate students, especially in the humanities? Is there a way we can introduce some of this exposure earlier? Well, I, um, I, I mean, the short answer is yes, but I also think there are things that one could do without even getting into the curricula, which is has to do with changing a kind of um, a cultural, um, a culture of, of how we approach graduate education. And that is to simply make transparent more of the processes and more of the systems in which we are all embedded. I think sometimes it is genuinely surprising to students um, just how universities operate, yeah. how budgets, control what departments can do, how department budgets are related to, you know, a college budget and, you know, what endowments actually mean and what a restricted endowment actually mean and what spendable gifts are. Things, you know, some of these things, I think we just, um, just elevating those to kind of transparency and to, you know, kind of forward communication is enormously helpful because some of that is ambient information that students um, can take on in the same way they take on all kinds of other information. When I think about uh, very fondly, but also when I think about my graduate education and all the things I learned about um, faculty hierarchies and things, that was a lot of ambient information. There was other ambient information that I could have learned yeah. um, about. And to, just to go back to publishing too, even you know when we think about you know, the student is, is encouraged to do research and to produce a paper and to submit to a journal. But what we were rarely talking about is um, how library catalogs were, um, were being shaped by the expertise of librarians mm -hmm. who were working on these rare materials and thus making accessible to us certain things and how publishers were seeking acquisitions and how, you know, and on and on and on and on. In other words, just giving us a, a better sense of where we are in space, as it were, kind of a professional proprioception in a sense, mm. um, might be you know, helpful as well. I mean, I love the Futures Project. I think it's really forward thinking and smart and interesting. And I'm really keen to, you know, to kind of follow that. Um, and I, I, I agree with you that earlier is better, but I also think this just making things more transparent and talking more about these systems is good. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, I think there's there's things that are always, you know, local and institution specific, and then there are best practices, right? And mm -hmm. here, one of the things that I'm really committed to, and however long I'm here in this role, and I hope it's a long time, um, yeah. is just being more, we have to be transparent. And it's not that it, you know, it's just the models change over time, we've grown. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to, for the first time, have a a shared governance body, which I think is very important. Um, cool. It's getting going, it'll have student representation as well. Um, and I feel that that's just important to let people know, as you say, how things work, what the larger social economy is, um, mm -hmm. in which we're all embedded. And I, and I do yeah. think, you know, obviously you do have to sometimes um, compartmentalize things and focus on one task, but I do think sometimes the nature of the humanities PhD can be, it's such a deep dive, it's often such an individual deep dive that it may be that we need collectively to make more of an effort to just have that openness to the world be a present mm -hmm. part of, maybe as you said, not necessarily an official curriculum, but at least available. I'll give you one example yeah. here. So here in, in the, the biology department, with Roshni Rao's help, who, who's heading up futures, they've, they've created a credit bearing course um, that can um, help to introduce PhD students to what the different career options are for somebody with a PhD in biology. And I just think that's great. It's not, it's not a required course, but it, it can, you, if you take it, you can get credit toward the PhD degree. And I think that's a very forward looking um, kind of a thing to do. Um, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, at the Omohundro Institute, we were lucky that, um, William and Mary's history department and other departments had committed to mm -hmm. um, a model of what was, um, I don't know what that title will be going forward, but a model of apprenticeship where mm -hmm. um, graduate students would work um, at, in, the, um, in our publishing department and in our publishing program and be intimately involved in the production of yeah. the William and Mary quarterly and the books and so on. So rather than as teaching assistants, and you know, even just just to, and they do other things too. We have now um, folks who are working in digital media and all kinds of things. But just opening students to um, to the variety of ways that historians, in our case, work in the world, 
um, right from the beginning um, as part of their graduate education has been quite important. Um, and I, I think that's a useful, it's a, certainly a model I continue to think about and I wanna think about here um, yeah. at the JCB. That makes perfect sense. So let, let's talk for a little bit about historians then. So one of the questions, excellent questions that we had mm -hmm. that came in was, do you have any colleagues in the field who worked for think tanks after their PhDs? You know, what did they think of that kind of work compared to academia? And I wonder if you could talk about that or if you've known people who've worked in federal government or government associations, yep. things like that. Yeah. Yes, yes, great. And, and by the way, thank you all for the interesting questions because they really are, they are good and um, thought provoking and I would not expect any different. Um, but yes, um, so some I, I can think about my own students and I can think about um, colleagues that I know who have worked just in the two cases that you're talking about in the kind of DC area. One of the great things about Hopkins, of course, is its um, geographic location and its proximity to, um, to both, um, well, its embeddedness in Baltimore, a wonderful city, and its proximity to DC. Um, and I have known both students and colleagues who have worked in think tanks, big and small think tanks. Um, uh, you know, big places like Brookings and smaller, more dedicated and focused mm -hmm. uh, places, um, and also folks working as historians across the federal government in anything like you might predict the Library of Congress, but also the State Department, which has long had or yeah. in and all of the military services have had historians, branches of historians. The Army's is probably the most robust, the Center for Military History um, at the Army, which has had, you know, a long standing. Um, commitment to historical perspective. And um, so I, you know, I've known folks who have worked as historians in, in all of these different places and very successfully so. I also have, you know, had many uh, colleagues who were either, so I'm not just talking about um, folks who are confronting the very severe crisis of, um, of the academic job market now, but I'm talking about people of my age and and, uh, and older than I am who chose to do different things. So who went into um, political consulting, who went into investment banking and because they were historians did really well, I think. <laughs> um, you know, people who did lots of different things, um, but not despite, but rather because of their training, um, their advanced graduate training in the humanities. It's so great to hear I, I, because I just think, um, my memory and sometimes just anecdotally what I hear is that the world can feel as a humanities PhD student, the world can feel sometimes um, uh, bounded, right? By yes. this idea of the word job meaning only one kind of job. And, yeah. and I just think that it's very important to stress that that's actually not the way the world is outside of the university and it's available. And I, and I just wanna make sure we're all doing as much as we can to make folks aware of that fact. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I, I think um, there is no doubt that the statistics show that the academic job market is the worst it's ever been. I mean, it's just, you know, a, a combination of the decline in humanities, academic employment and pandemic. Um, but I just wanna be clear that I'm not here talking with you about this now because of what happened the last two years. This is my experience of my entire professional career of the graduate students that I had at American University when I was there for 10 years, before I was at William and Mary for 15 years. And my graduate students all the way along have been going out into the world and doing different things have been, you know, when I think about my first, just even my first handful of uh, graduate students who were working in publishing um, in um, federal museums, working in secondary schools, um, you know, this historians work in different places in the world. Um, some historians work in higher education. <laughs> That's, I think that, and that has always been true. There is an acute crisis right now and we can talk about that too. But, um, but that, you know, I don't want that long history and that long um, experience to be effaced because of this current crisis in academic employment. I mean, maybe we should talk about this a little bit, the crisis. And I want to make sure just um, for folks on this call, please feel free to start chatting questions if you have them. Yes. We, we can open it up to feel free to raise raise your hand um, uh, if, if questions come up, because um, we do want to hear from you as well. Um, but I wonder if we could talk about the, you know, this notion of a crisis um, from a couple of different perspectives. The, the first might be that one that you raise, which is that there's really been a long tradition of people with PhDs in history and other humanities fields working in different contexts, right? So there's that. Um, 
there is something particular to the humanities as well. Um, so uh, Paul Ryder and Chad Wellman just published a book um, on the modern academic humanities. And their basic thesis mm -hmm. is that in some ways, the modern academic humanities have always constituted themselves in response to a perceived crisis. And it's an interesting book. And, it go, and they're, both, they're both Germanists, actually. So they go mm -hmm. back to a lot of early 19th century and late 18th century German thinkers. But there's an interesting thing there, I think, as well. And, and I'm wondering, like, where do we find that balance in the humanities between, you know, robustly understanding all the strengths that, that folks with humanities PhDs have and what they can do versus mm -hmm. responding to reality, which, as you say, I mean, there has been a constriction in, it, uh, in academic employment nationwide and the pandemic has has if anything accelerated that um yeah so we're, we're, how do we situate ourselves in that way yeah and i yeah it, it's mm, you raise a huge <laughs> set of questions historical yeah. questions as well yeah. as sociological questions and i think it's rooted in um very rightly in the experience of students right now who will be feeling very acutely my own students are feeling this very acutely i have you know phd students who are Mm -hmm. who are seeking employment right now, who are, you know, working in postdocs and, and various things. And for them, this is, um, this crisis is extremely real. And, you know, I can point out to them that there, there is a longer history of this and that does not help the crisis that they're experiencing or feeling. So I want to just be clear, you know, ab about, about that. But I, I guess I also just want to come back to my own sense that the world is better when there are more historians, and I suspect I would know biologists who would say the same thing, I would know computer scientists who would say the same thing, I would say information specialists who would say the same thing, that the world is better when there are more historians working in more places in the world. That is, mm -hmm. when we all get out and interact in different places, it's better. You know, my parents were working in a field where there was an industry and you know, you could people would seek academic employment or they would go and work in industry. And I tried to say to them that history doesn't really have an industry. History has a whole world of possible yeah. Yeah. <laughs> places of, of application. Um, and you know, I, I say that because I believe that and because I've seen that, that to be the case. But the other true thing here is that um, people are experiencing this sense that, I've seen people say this on social media, if you go for a job and someone says, sees you have a PhD, they think, oh, you're overqualified and they don't want to hire you for it. Um, or people say, you know, that the default um, non-academic employment for history PhDs or humanities PhDs is in museums, which are experiencing even more of a kind of jobs crisis. Mm -hmm. And I think if we, it's important to lift out of that a little bit and see the nonprofit world more broadly yeah. than, than just museums and to see um, the potential where one's, uh, where one's uh, advanced training actually is applicable not specifically applicable because I know about 18th century Philadelphia it doesn't make me great to manage staff, but right. it does mean that I have thought about a set of issues which have translatable value. Um, so, I wonder, um, can you, um, in terms of that issue of translation, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that again, just in a practical way. I mean, we do have um, this futures um, program now here at Johns Hopkins, so it, it can help in some of this, but for some of the folks on the call, how, how does one think about, you know, taking what might seem like a standard academic resume or CV and then converting it into something that's suitable for other, other audiences, right? Um, yeah, well, one thing um, that I think is, is important to note is that anybody who's finished a PhD has conducted advanced research, which means you've organized, you have explored, you have identified a major problem, and you have done original analysis. All of these things are critical in the world that we're living in. Um, and, you know, I don't think I need to say that we're living in a world of kind of information and knowledge crisis um, and that people who are expert in thinking about how you come to knowledge um, are, are needed out there. So I think that's um, a little bit of the kind of mystery of what happens in a PhD. Oh, you're erudite, you go into a, yeah. maybe you go into a room. I know those rooms don't look the same as, um, in the library as they did when I was there in the 1990s, <laughs> but deep in the, deep in the bowels. Um, but, um, but, you know, and then you come out with something smart and of course that's not it. it you, uh, you know, identify and then galvanize a massive amount of research material. You organize that, you systematize that, you analyze it. 
All of those things are really important, but we, we don't often talk about it that way. And I mm -hmm. think we should. Digital humanists, I think, are better about this because they're mm -hmm. thinking, you know, there's a kind of systems work that's behind digital humanities generally. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, using those words, research, organization, analysis, systems, some of those things, which are true, this is not a fake thing. This is not a putting a gloss on our work. This is what we do, actually. So again, I guess it's about excavation and transparency yeah. and process that strikes yeah. me as important.